Hi, everyone. I'm Salma Qureshi. Welcome to Neuroscientist Talk Shop, the University of Texas at San Antonio's Neuroscience Research Podcast. Today is February 25th, 2021. I have to remember to say that. And we're talking with Lara Hua, who has just established a new research program as of this January, yeah, uh, last month, as Assistant Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience at Baylor University, Waco. Hi, Lara, and congratulations on the new lab. Hi, thank you. So the Hua Lab uses behavioral pharmacology, uh, electrophysiology, circuit mapping, optogenetics, chemogenetics, um, and fiber photometry to determine how external stressors and endogenous stress signaling in the brain interact to drive excessive drinking. Um, so in, in the Zoom today, we're joined by our own addiction and behavior specialist, Matt Wanett. Hi, Matt. Hey. And as always, Charlie Wilson. Hi, Charlie. Oh. So I, there's so much cool stuff to talk about, and it's so relevant. Drinking is so relevant to everyone being shut in and Every time I have ventured out, I see people carrying huge cases of alcohol in a way that I've never seen seen it before. Um, so one of one of the key things about your work is is it, so there's this idea that stressors drive both um, social drinking and relapse in people with alcohol alcohol use disorder, and and then chronic alcohol drinking closes the loop and then reciprocally impacts stress systems in the brain, endogenous stress systems. So your work gets at some of the key effectors and the neural circuits upon which stress and alcohol interact to govern behavior. Um, so one of the things that I find most intriguing and counterintuitive um, is how patterns of alcohol consumption, namely binge versus continuous drinking, um, have very different outcomes for both consumption behavior and stress responses um, and behavioral responses. and that for those of us not in the business that's like a hugely weird idea to me can you can you say something about that and how you actually are studying that because it's it's not trivial to study alcohol use in, in rodents right they don't love drinking the right, right correct yeah thank you for asking so yeah historically it's been very difficult to get animals um, to drink excessive amounts of alcohol voluntarily because the taste of ethanol purely itself is very aversive. Um, and so historical methods, we've had to use kind of forced ethanol drinking, like alcohol liquid diet or um, ethanol vapor chamber. Um, and these come with their, you know, golden standards of rendering animals dependent. However, that may not be the most applicable to our human condition. And so I was really interested in kind of pursuing this theory how can we get these um, animals that you know may not have our social structures that we have complex uh, today in our environment? Um, you know, how can we get them to drink a lot? And so I looked back in the literature, and one of the um, major addiction researchers in our field, Roy Wise, he kind of established this intermittent access to alcohol protocol with a two-bottle choice to 20% ethanol and water. And he did this in Long Evans rats. And back then it was really, really uh, effective at escalating um, alcohol drinking in rats, but guess who else drinks even more than that because of their very small body weight are C57 black bitch germans. And so I took the combination of those two factors and created this, you know, published this intermittent access protocol. And we think that it's really, really interesting because with these limited periods of scheduled um, intervals of drinking, uh, separated by mini periods of withdrawal or restriction or abstinence, whatever have you, you have this cycle of access and then non-access and non. So these repeated schedules, um, and they're often called kind of generator schedules. And when we look at this phenomena over different periods or different types of behaviors in our field, such as binge uh, feeding on high fat diet or um, sugar binging with um, sucrose drinking in our animal procedures. You know, it, it's consistent in that there's some period of limited access where the animals will learn that, okay, now I have the option to take, but what's gonna happen, um, it might get taken away. Um, and I find this really, really fascinating and it reminds us of, you know, happy hour or last call or maybe like prohibition in America where, or our, you know, 
uh, lowered alcohol drinking age or something like that where it's restricted. And so when you have access, you over drink, right? And then in comparison, which I find also very fascinating is this continuous access um, to these substances. So when we think about alcohol, this access all the time, continuous, unlimited access, maybe it's uh, kind of the Mediterranean lifestyle of drinking, you know, uh, a little more, um, less restricted in that society. Um, you, you see, sure, a, a lot of drinking behavior across time, um, but the outcomes and the morbidities are significantly less. Like their rates of alcohol use disorder are one-tenth of ours. So it kind of, you know, um, puts into perspective the pattern of how we drink. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting though, because food is appetitive, <laughs> whereas the alcohol is aversive, yet they have a choice. And so it really, it probably takes a few intervals for them to understand that, wait a minute, that felt good. And it probably had to do with that. So you see, it's, it's, it's a different, it's, it's very different from food in terms of the acquisition, right? That is or, true. No. That, is, that is true. Yeah, yeah. And it is interesting because, you know, our rodents are very neophobic and, you know, it, it doesn't smell good, this pure ethanol. And so it, it does take a little bit of escalation, but in general, and, and we can see that in our outbred rat lines or outbred mouse lines. Um, but when you when it comes to the C57 black six J mouse, they have very, very high preference to start, but then we can escalate that uh, with our intermittent access protocol. Yeah. So I was curious with, uh, have you detected or looked at their sort of behavior within one of those days? You know, do you have sort of a legometer sort of attached to the, the bottles? Because, um, you know, as, as far as sort of getting a, a, a translational you know, impact, you've got like within that day, they're taking, you know, tons more than the continuous access when, you know, the, the intermittent access uh, mice. Are they binging? Are they, do, you know, what is their, the profile of their alcohol intake? Do they load up and then take down or is it just a sustained level all throughout? Right, right, yes. Um, I haven't uh, looked myself at lycometer activity, but uh, the Mitchek lab has followed up on this protocol. And what we, what they see in it, tell me, is um, yeah, and in, in, as soon as they get access, they have these really high blood ethanol concentrations. So the intoxicating um, brain reaching concentrations of alcohol, and then they kind of maintain that intoxication at least for a few hours. And then um, the next day when we're coming in to take the alcohol away, they'll load up again before it gets taken away. So mm -hmm. they, and that's after several periods of learning when um, during the uh, photo period, alcohol comes and alcohol goes, which uh, is um, approximately three hours into the dark phase. And this has uh, been kind of established in the field by the drinking the dark protocol. Um, and we know that our rodents will um, drink highest amounts of alcohol as well as consume other you know, fluids as well as food around three hours into the dark phase. So, so then following abstinence for both of these, the continuous versus the intermittent, you see very, so you probe these animals with, with stressors and you find incredibly different responses to the stressors. So can you, can you unpack that work? That, that's work that came out last year, I think, right? Right, right, right. So um, yeah, so we're talking about um, my latest eLife paper where after long-term alcohol drinking, um, we're looking at this protracted withdrawal phase. And we know, of course, there are, um, you know, uh, maladaptive neuroadaptations that occur during acute withdrawal, but it's also really fascinating to look at this protracted withdrawal period. Are things still misaligned and um, plastic or, or are these permanent neuroadaptations that occur after this history of alcohol drinking? And uh, at the level of behavior, what we've looked at is their uh, reactions or misreactions um, to a predator odor stress. Um, and so what we're doing is looking at this TMT trimethylthiazoline, a very pungent fox-derived predator odor synthetic, um, and we pipette it into their home cage. And what we see is compared to alcohol-naive water controls, 
the animals that we're drinking high levels of intermittent access to alcohol are kind of contacting this predator odor in a really aberrant, weird, reactionary way. And also they are, um, whereas water controls are doing this defensive burying behavior at this aversive stimulus in their home cage, uh, the alcohol animals have an absence of this behavior. And uh, we can uh, have a variety of different kappa opioid receptor and dynorphin related um, manipulations uh, to counteract this and um, kind of restore the behavior to more like water control. And this is happening not when they're intoxicated, but quite a while after they have been removed from alcohol. Right? Correct, correct, correct. So this is well um, a week, a week and a half um, after their last intoxication session. So they have an aberrant response during the alcohol use phase. And is that a uh, response different across the continuous versus the intermittent during the alcohol consuming phase? Um, so I haven't quite uh, looked at the stressors after continuous access to alcohol, but instead what I have looked at is the stressors preceding continuous and intermittent access. And if we do certain stressors like social defeat stress, um, so um, 10 consecutive days in the resident intruder protocol, we can both increase continuous access and intermittent access uh, drinking. Yeah, with, with social defeat. So Going back to sort of your, the ELEF paper and some of the data, hopefully you, you feel comfortable talking about, but um, you know, you, not all stressors are the same. And I guess we use the, the word stressor quite loosely because, I mean, we don't know. I mean, it's, it's operationally, you know, probably the HBA axis is getting activated, we would presume. But, um, you know, you, you had some interesting results that you found, or you, you talked about that were, uh, differences, whether it was for swim test or, you know, versus TMT. And I was just wondering if you could maybe comment a little bit on the sort of different stressor modalities and I don't know, potentially what that means in the context of, you know, alcohol intake and how that influences, you know, subsequent reactivity. I mean, a, a looming stress is, you know, is sensory, is, is very different a sensory experience, experience than TMT as opposed to, you know, being put into a water bath. And so, yeah, if you might be able to comment a little bit on that. Yes, yes, thank you for, for asking. I mean, this is such a, an interesting field is the stress field. And um, we can think about all these different variables such as the frequency of the stressor or the severity of the stressor and you know, how is the, the animal interpreting that versus another type or a chronic intermittent variable stressor, consistency, predictability, you know, timing. Um, and it, it's all very, very tricky in terms of being able to see um, escalations in alcohol drinking uh, as an example. Um, um, yeah, but I, I'm, very, very interested. And I, I really like these stressors that perhaps may have some higher translational validity, like social defeat stress. And I mean, I personally think that, um, you know, social stress, uh, whether it's social isolation or social defeat is something that us humans experience. But, you know, that can also be more latent everyday type of, you know, anxiety provoking stress of being an Axenio or living through the pandemic or, you know, this chronic, chronic um, overarching stress or anxiety or something like that. Whereas our, our more, you know, pinpointed stressors of having a deadline that we need to meet are also very triggering, right? And so um, I believe that, uh, you know, alcohol drinking can be, uh, after or before any one of these uh, sort of situations. So um, yeah, stress has been so, so fascinating to me. And then also translating, translating it back to our, our animals. Um, court and HPA axis output is not, I mean, sure, our court responses, our TMT, our uh, social defeat stress has one of the, in, the highest 
uh, generators of um, court um, in animals, but then what is even greater than social defeat stress is sex. So that even has more higher court elevation than social defeat stress, than um, uh, shock, than uh, restraint stress, than all these things, right? So it's also, well, what are our measures? Are they reaction, behavioral reactions? Are they uh, hormonal reactions, brain reactions? So um, I love this field and it's uh, increasingly complex, but um, right, I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a great point just highlighting. I mean, it's tricky to to say what is stress. I mean, court goes up. I mean, it, it you know it has circadian rhythms as well. And so, you know, how do we how do we define stress and what does it mean to be stress? I mean, it's it's, it's a, a very challenging, open ended question. Right, right. And what if our thresholds for stress are um, individually different, right? And so we have our different coping styles, different coping strategies, but in the end. Um, they're all reacting to the same stressor, just perhaps in a different way. And, and also just what reactions are actually adaptive versus maladaptive. That seems yes. like a, a huge question <laughs> to me, yes. Yes, yes, um, yes, yes, yes. especially now that people are talking about resilience as a, a sort of having an abnormal stress response actually equates to being more resilient, right? right. So how does that right. With this right. Stuff. I mean, I I always love talking about kind of this. Uh, what are the innate biological roles of these structures and these pathways? Because we need to understand, you know, the fundamental, maybe even evolutionary biology behind how these animals are working and you know reacting to these stressors. Because we see that oh, maybe the females and males even react baseline differently and you know that may be because of an evolutionary drive towards certain things um, but when we compare you know across treatment groups I, I totally agree with you that um, you know resilience in certain coping styles and then okay active versus passive or um, are these hyper reactions are they hypo reactions after alcohol drinking um, I can just say that they're very different. <laughs> so from an experimental point of view, um, how, do you, how do people who study stress deal with Matt's comment? Like stress is a, is a word applied to many really different things. So is it best just to settle on one thing and just say, I'm always gonna, do this one thing and call it stress? Or is it better to try to do a whole range of different things and ask whether they all produce the same brain change or something like that? Right, right. Yeah, um, I like to think of certain, certain protocols and experimental designs as having your stress probe. So kind of this um, trigger or experiment that will reveal kind of the baseline what is happening. Um, so a stress probe or something that's, um, yeah, will will reveal kind of their innate what has changed. Um, but then also we can deal with uh, certain protocols like chronic variable, um, you know, stress um, that have a whole variety of a different insults so that they don't habituate to a certain stressor or something like that um, in order to maybe model more uh, PTSD-like symptoms um, or just chronic anxiety-like um, phenotypes. So um, I don't know, Matt, what, what would you also I, I think it's, it's really sort of a philosophical uh, debate. I mean, I think Really, you just need to be specific about what you're doing. Um, I mean, we get we get hung up by the words. I mean, the uh, yeah. I think when we had Steve Merritt on here, we we're talking about fear conditioning. Is that stress? And all and you know, all sub disciplines have their own different sort of terminology. And you know, fear conditioning is really you know, stress field could look at that and say, well, no, that's just a stressor. And you know, they learn about the stressor, and it's you know, uh, two sides of the same coin. 
But I guess from, you know, going forward as to sort of, you know, ultimately we want to devise strategies to be able to mitigate the, you know, the, the problematic aspects of, you know, stress on drug seeking or, you know, drug seeking and inappropriate, you know, responding towards stressors. And I guess going to the, the former one, um, I'm, I'm curious if, uh, I mean, there's a lot of work, uh, Marco Benero, uh, you know, and he's been, you know, devising a lot of, you know, really, um, you know, Yavim Shaham's group now um, on his own, um, uh, looking at strategies to try and, you know, reduce drug taking and coming up with really interesting uh, behavioral designs where, you know, having access to a con specific is in some ways more reinforcing than actually taking the drug itself. And I'm wondering if, you know, if you group house the animals or is, has that sort of filtered over, I guess, into the, the alcohol field? I mean, Roy Wise is, you know, he's godfather of, you know, addiction research or, you know, or research into preclinical models of substance use disorders um, more broadly. But, you know, has that sort of from the, uh, the, the drug addiction or the, a lot from the, the cocaine, methamphetamine, heroin, rodent models, has that translated over into, the, the alcohol research and are there sort of strategies of, you know, group housing animals, is that going to have a preventative effect perhaps on, you know, mitigating the effects of either drugs on stress response or, you know, stress on um, drug response. Sorry, that was meandering and so you feel free to take it wherever, but um, I'm, I'm sort of curious at the, the development of these behavioral models. And right, right, right. Um, yeah, that, that it, it reminds me of, uh, the initial experiments with the morphine taking at Rat Park, uh, where this beautifully enriched um, park for rats back in the day, um, uh, this huge, uh, I, I would say the, the square footage was like a New York apartment style full of conspecifics, males, females, peers, all these types of different rats. And, uh, they were drinking morphine, so morphine preference and consumption, and so um, they had them become dependent on the morphine, and they put them in rat park, and slowly um, they reduced their morphine preference over time. And um, we, I have not done that in the intermittent access protocol, but it, it does come to mind the work of Andre Gudinian's uh, group at OHSU. And he uses bowls and um, alcohol drinking. And so with these, you know, um, socially uh, pair bonding animals, um, he's shown that in general, when they are group housed together, you can have a high drinking bowl that, you know, learns to abstain <laughs> when paired with a non-drinking bowl. So um, it has gone on, but I, I um, haven't quite, pursued that um, in my own line of studies, I would say. But, but yeah, these in, environmental enrichment, I think is a huge part of um, um, different levels of alcohol drinking. So for example, what, what we have found is, okay, the, the mouse, the mice that are housed with the red huts and their nestlets and these sorts of things, yeah, tend to drink um, a little bit less than th those that have no enrichment in their cage, right? And then there are all these other external variables like the food and the diet that they're eating um, also influences their alcohol drinking. So if they're on a more protein heavy, maybe a little bit uh, more calorie dense diet, they're gonna drink more in the intermittent access protocol compared to on a healthier, more vegetarian mouse diet. <laughs> so. Um, we can start, we are starting to get at a little bit of these things, um, but uh, yeah, I, the group house setting, I'm sure would decrease their alcohol drinking. And that, that actually, um, it comes to mind. So some of my initial graduate, not, not even graduate, some of my initial research in undergraduate um, at Tufts in the Mitchak lab was using squirrel monkeys. Um, and so we had colonies of these squirrel monkeys and we would give them low to moderate doses of alcohol um, and then one at a time. And so we would monitor kind of their social interactions um, in their social hierarchy. And as you can imagine, this is uh, quite fun to, to observe and the um, 
alpha males would become a little bit more aggressive and more, you know, sexually show more sexual behavior towards the females, whereas the lower ranking female squirrel monkeys would A, drink more, but also become in general more uh, affiliative towards their other female monkeys. So all very, very interesting um, and kind of, it, it depends on where they were in that social hierarchy um, to, to ask, you know, how, how, how much are they drinking first of all, and then how do they behave after they've had a low to moderate so do you see that, do you see some of the effectors being regulated, like the uh, dynorphin and the CRF and in, in those animals by uh, being group housed, or would you imagine that that would be the case? Right, right. I mean, I, I would imagine that that is the, the case, but uh, with, with these studies, we, we have them for a long period of time and um, haven't quite looked at their brain metabolism, uh, sorry, brain metabolites. Um, but we do know that Kathy Grant and her um, uh, rhesus monkey work at OHSU also is looking um, at these, you know, stress neuropeptides as well as neurosteroids and being able to correlate that with their alcohol drinking behavior. Mm -hmm. So we were not able to do that with our squirrel monkeys, but um, that research is going on. So. Charlie, you were about to say something, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe I'm changing the subject a little bit, but I was gonna say that it seems to me one of the difficulties with uh, studying alcohol is that it just acts everywhere in the brain. And so you can't really pin it down like, oh, this acts like GABA synapses or something like that. It does that, but it also does a bunch of other things. And so that means that the whole brain is fair game. And uh, so trying to pin down the particular pathway that's responsible for the particular thing that you're looking at, uh, how do you overcome that? that? There's a, it seems like a, a real energy of activation getting going just to find the right place to look and the right thing to look for. Right, yes. <laughs> I mean, I think you bring up an excellent, excellent point is that um, we are not as lucky as other <laughs> <laughs> fields that may have a very specific uh, binding site on the GABA receptor. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, I do formulate, you know, all of my hypotheses on our past literature of, okay, what are the, the most um, dysregulated brain areas, um, you know, related to our behavior. So whether it's the drinking or the withdrawal and you know, okay, we have excitotoxicity during withdrawal, but also these certain areas involved with the binge and kind of these whole brain connections, I think you're totally right that it, it is this network of um, plasticity altogether. And yes, we can uh, probe a specific brain area and uh, cellular population, but I mean, it is working all together in concert or in disconcert. And um, we as neuroscientists like to concentrate on uh, shoulders and up and, and alcohol, of course, goes through our first pass metabolism as well in the gut and, um, and the liver and as neuroscientists, we need to talk more to our liver researchers as well um, as it's all in this, you know, maladaptive feedback loop uh, in alcohol use disorder. So, yeah. How about even the adrenal glands? I mean, is there an alcohol effect directly on the adrenal gl glands secretions? Uh, I mean, I, I can imagine, yes. I don't know that literature because uh, I purposely ignore. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, if we're measuring stress using some secretion of the adrenal gland, right. then, uh, right. then it's possible the alcohol is acting right, right there, isn't it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, for sure, for sure. And it, and it does remind me of, you know, um, this new, I don't want to call it a resurgence, but the gut brain uh, microbiome access, I think is incredibly relevant to alcohol drinking as well. So 
maybe to follow up and in spite of the challenges that there is no magical alcohol receptor in the body or brain, um, your work has actually done, uh, you've done a fantastic job of identifying some critical circuits that are responsible for the interaction between stress and, uh, or how alcohol um, use subsequent influences the behavioral response to, to stress. And I was wondering if you might be able to, to comment a little bit about this, you know, this pathway um, and some of the cool results you had in your recent uh, paper. Right, great, yeah, uh, thank you. So what we are looking at is um, a specific cellular population, dynorphin cells. So dynorphin is um, the endogenous ligand to the kappa opioid receptor and opioid peptide. And normally we think of um, opioid peptides as kind of ruling over these pleasurable positive reinforcement um, episodes of alcohol drinking. But after repeated cycles of binge alcohol drinking and withdrawal, we really see this um, evidence of the kappa opioid receptor involvement, dynorphin involvement, so this dysphoric aversive uh, period after chronic alcohol drinking. And we were looking at the BNST, this um, sort of integrative hub in the brain, so part of the extended amygdala regulating you know, stress behaviors, anxiety, addiction, you name it, um, and aversive responses also. So uh, I was really interested in probing the kappa opioid receptor dynorphin population in the bed nucleosome striatomonas in the BST. And um, what we were finding was that there's this excitatory glutamatergic drive um, in these cells that perhaps is coming from the prefrontal cortex as one of the uh, canonical, straightforward glutamatergic sources to um, more of the limbic structures. Uh, and so I was really interested in studying this pathway and we've done some um, dread manipulations uh, that are pathway specific to the prelimbic to the BNST, as well as looked at um, some ex vivo opto manipulations. And we found that there was indeed this kind of enhanced um, glutamatergic activity, perhaps through you know, increased ampa amplitude, as well as increased um, optically evoked EPSCs onto these BNST dynorphin cells um, at the level of um, the synapse. But also we could parallel this with um, pharmacology by probing the kappa opioid receptor system, um, as well as doing some uh, dynorphin specific uh, deletions using a block dynorphin mouse line. So I'm curious about these dynorphin neurons that you find in the BNST. And I guess, you know, that's one characteristic of these neurons is they produce dynorphin. But um, what else, are, what other is the primary neurotransmitters do they have in there? Is it, are they GABAergic, glutamatergic? Are there other, you know, neuropeptides that are co-released and where do they go? Where, where, where's the dynorphin being released? Is it vocal circuits? Is it projection? I mean, the BNST goes to quite a few other brain regions as well. Um, yeah, I guess what's known. Yes, yes. Yes, these are all of the relevant questions, right? And so um, we, with our transgenic mouse lines, we can only say that they're dynorphin containing cells. And because they're also CRF containing cells, they're also GABAergic cells in the BNST. Um, and so what could be a really nice, you know, parallel line of investigation is to do this in a CRF Cree line as well, or um, maybe only pinpointing GABAergic activity or glutamate cells, for example. But we, we also know that um, these are GABAergic cells and they also really uh, CRF, our most favorite other neuropeptide. Um, and I believe that they also have uh, nociceptin as well. So kind of these uh, stress peptides, some opioid based, some kind of, you know, more hyperclinic based. Um, but uh, in terms of the circuitry, I haven't quite looked at these outputs and that's a whole other um, I guess grant application, right? And <laughs> of, you know, uh, is, is this local? Is this coming from elsewhere? Where is it coming from? Um, is this coming from hypothalamus or from other sources, hindbrain? Um, also, you know, what, what, what are these downstream effectors that are most important, right? So are these like thalamic um, projections? Are these 
mesolimbic projections, which uh, the BNST and uh, the VTA are really, really uh, interestingly well connected as well. Um, and um, so there, there are just so many ways to, to take these. And as neuroscientists, it's kind of nice to have um, a certain toolkit, right, to, to explore different sort of connections. And part of what I want to do in the future is really tease apart each one of these pathways, whether it's the incoming or the outgoing projection. OK, can we attribute um, a specific behavior, for example, like the defensive burying or the avoidance, or is this uh, specific to poor swim, or is this um, generalizable to TMT, poor swim, social defeat, you know, so um, there, there's uh, so much to do and to explore, really. Yeah. I mean, e even layered on, on that, there are these deeper complexities that you've looked at in prior work that have to do with heavy versus moderate versus intermittent drinking and ha them impinging on different CRF subtypes, receptors, yeah. at least in the dorsal raphe, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, the, the amount of complexity here is, is huge. And how do you decide which model of drinking is the most relevant to preclinical type stuff, which is, I guess, you know, what you want to write around anyway. Um, right, 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 exactly. And I, I find it all very fascinating and worth exploring. And I, I find that I'm not a, um, uh, you know, specific brain site centrist type of person. And, you know, I, I've published in um, the mesolimbic area. I've looked at RAFE, serotonin. I've looked at BNST as well as my cortical papers, you know, and so I, I feel like I'm really attracted by wherever the science uh, will take me in these protocols. So perhaps maybe the difference between um, intermittent and continuous may lie at the level of the RAFE, but when you integrate stress in there, maybe we need that mesolimbic um, system and the involvement of dopamine and CRF to come in at, at, at that point with the addition of stress. So um, I find it all very, uh, yeah, fascinating to kind of tease apart. Okay, should we call it? Oh, shoot. In the video, I have a hard time cut it because we all sort of like just jump. So now I'm gonna have to do that, sorry. Um, do we, what, what is, do we have anything else? Do you wanna end on another, no? Um, I have so many questions, but they're not, no one else cares about. <laughs> well, I, I, I've got one quick side one. Um, the, uh, I don't know if there's a further editing, but um, what about the, you know, we're talking about translational relevance and, you know, problematic drinking typically doesn't start in, this is with all drugs of abuse. It doesn't start in adulthood. It often starts in like a juvenile period. And I guess, have you looked at, you know, the, the amount of intermittent access, you know, do you need the six weeks or I, I believe it was six weeks. Um, I'm sure from your perspective, it would be nice if you could do two weeks because it's a pain in the butt to have animals around for six weeks, you know, training them up. Um, but also with a shorter time period, you could look at uh, the susceptibility at different um, developmental stages. So in a more adolescent mouse versus an adult mouse. And I guess, have you or anybody been looking sort of at those developmental uh, differences? Yeah, great question. So uh, I have looked at, but have not published, um, the, the phase of kind of early adolescence and these animals will drink even more than the adults. It's just incredible. And we can see their behavioral phenotypes are, you know, physically intoxicated, whereas the adults don't really show that during um, kind of the dark phase. But we, the adolescents will drink the same fluid amount as the adults, but since they weigh half the size or significantly less, their levels are even higher. So, um, yes, we we could pursue that translational relevance, um, and it would be really really interesting uh, as well. But we we also know that um, we're kind of hitting them at the yeah, adulthood, young young adulthood kind of period, um, but for sure the plasticity mechanisms would be even, you know, more interesting and uh, greater with that added period of development, for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah.
Are there any clinical protocols right now in human? Do, or is naloxone being used or is what what is there a standard, a clinical standard at all other than extinction? Uh, yeah, so for, for um, our protocols, we have kind of three um, historical treatments for alcohol use disorder or alcohol dependence, depending on which definition of the DSM you have. Um, uh, so disulfiram, we have looked a lot at anti abuse. Uh, we also have naltrexone, um, so that's our mu opioid receptor um, yeah, antagonist. And so th these are kind of getting at, um, you know, trying to decrease the motivation and the craving for the alcohol. Um, whereas our typical treatments like benzodiazepines can treat the withdrawal phase. Uh, so dampening down um, those symptoms of withdrawal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, it's really exciting to hear about all of the new um, treatments that are coming down the pipeline, for sure, like baclofen or GABA B uh, modulators, things like that, things that modulate um, neuroimmune responses. I think it's called epinolase or something like that. But um, yeah, the we're, we're, we're trying, we're trying to hit, hit it uh, on the treatment front for sure. Okay, well, thank you. I think we have to mention Hitoshi uh, Morikawa's quote here. He said, you know, he's, he's an anesthesiologist and a, and a drug abuse specialist. And he always said to us, no matter what, drugs of abuse, they have different effects on different people, but alcohol always works alcohol always does the same thing and it always works. So uh, I think you'll be in business for a while. So anyway, thank you for joining us, Lara Hua. This has been um, Neuroscientist Talk Shop. Thank you, Matt and Charlie and everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Okay, there's gonna be some editing. Sorry, I have to take myself out. <laughs>